Well, about 3,500 years ago, brethren, God performed an amazing miracle when he freed a slave people from Egypt and made them a nation in their own right. The later crossing of the Red Sea was another tremendous miracle of God. It was a tremendous miracle that God of Israel performed. And each year, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we commemorate the deliverance of our people Israel from Egypt, particularly with the night to be much observed, when they first came out of Egypt with a high hand. And we look to that event because it is a type of our own spiritual lives, our coming out of this world and our exodus out of Satan's world into the promised land of God's church. That the Feast of Unleavened Bread concluded with this climatic, climactic event, the crossing of the Red Sea. And the crossing of the Red Sea happened, brethren, exactly on this day, on the last day of Unleavened Bread. Now, just as the first exodus occurred in... Uh, 1443 before Christ, it is also going to occur again with the return of Jesus Christ and establishment of the kingdom of God on this earth. Once again, brethren, the remnant of Israel is going to cross the Red Sea, but this time on a far more massive scale. The events of the second exodus of Israel will eclipse those of the first exodus because they will be far more dramatic. Then in the world to come, those who come in the second exodus will study the events of the first exodus in their Bibles. They'll have that historical record to look at, that precursor of the far greater exodus, second exodus of Israel. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 11, because we're going to see seven similarities between these two exoduses. One historic that happened and we are marking, that we have just marked and celebrated in, during the days of unleavened bread. And the other prophetic, which is just ahead of us. And many people are not aware of that, brethren, and for some reason in God's church, at least in the worldwide church of God, this very important event, second exodus, that is very clearly outlined in the Bible, was not really preached for I don't know what reason. Sadly, today, the churches of God at large also refuse to preach about this wonderful event just ahead of us, brethren. Wonderful event. There is nothing shameful about it. There is nothing horrible about it. It's something so exciting and so wonderful and so well described in the Bible that we are to be as excited as we should about all the truth that God has given us. And again, those who want to de de destroy the, the uh, truth about the house of Israel in the Bible, they're just uh, totally wrong and they're on the wrong path. I'm, I, I would dare to say today to you that they're on the path to become the synagogue of Satan because you cannot understand the Bible unless you understand the identity of Israel and unless we understand the role of Israel in salvation, in God's plan of salvation of whole humankind. So, let's go first. Uh, we can learn some things about the second exodus from the first Isaiah chapter 11 verse 15. Isaiah eleven fifteen. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. Now on the map, we can see that the tongue of the Egyptian sea, brethren, is referring to what is now called the Gulf of Suez. So the prophecy says that after the return of Jesus Christ, God is going to utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. The people of Israel walked into their captivity in Egypt. They walked into captivity, but in a future time, they will be able to cross that Red Sea, just as their forefathers did in the past. The verse continues, and with that, with his mighty wind, shall he shake his hand over the river. Most commentaries feel this is referring to the Euphrates River, and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shot. Now, translators generally feel that what is going to happen here is that the great Euphrates River will be reduced to the seven small streams that can be easily crossed on foot. Well, they might be correct in believing that the river referred to here is the Euphrates. In part, they chose the Euphrates because, uh, based on the next verse 16, and there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, because the ancient Assyria brethren was on, in the area of the Euphrates, though the modern Assyria, modern day Assyria is Germany and Austria in Central Europe, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. You see, it says like as it was, because the history is about to repeat itself, and it is going to repeat itself on a far greater scale. And I'm so excited, brethren, that I'm the one who has restored this tremendous truth to the Church of God in the widest community because nobody preaches on this topic. And this is indeed a topic so exciting. And I'm very 
privileged by God. I am so privileged to be able to present to you many good things that I've preserved from our past heritage, from the heritage that we have from the Worldwide Church of God, and the heritage that we have, of course, from uh, from those even before him. There are Rupert and others before the Worldwide Church of God. And all of that, you know, coupled also with the great blessing that we have, uh, with the fact that there is... Uh, there is Dr. Bob Thiel who, is, who has been providing us with very elaborate explanations of current events and future events. But anyway, the, uh, the uh, topic of the second exodus is so important. It is so relevant and uh, it is so exciting that I see no reason whatsoever that it should not be preached. But nevertheless, again, it was I indeed and... Uh, Without any false modesty, it was I who has restored this important truth in the Church of God wide community and I've established it and, 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 and put it before all of you here and I've established it well in our continuing Church of God circles. Thanks be to the Eternal and thanks be to God that we can understand this coming great second exodus that even messianic circles are well aware about, brethren, but of all the peoples on the earth, we as God's people should understand and need to understand it. So the commentaries may be correct in believing that the river referred to in Isaiah 11.15 is the Euphrates because the Hebrew expression can be also translated as shall smite it into seven streams. But you see, it is interesting to look at the mouth of the Nile in Lower Egypt the river Nile, as it begins to enter the Mediterranean Sea, breaks up into seven streams. So this verse, well, nowadays, it breaks up anciently. Nowadays, it has only two streams uh, flowing into the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the river Nile, as it begins to enter the Mediterranean Sea, breaks up, as I said, into seven streams. So this verse may be talking actually about Nile, about the Nile. And I'll smudge it in those, it in those seven streams, may be talking about those Israelites to the west of the Nile, who will be able to go over that section of the Nile, the mouth of the Nile close to the Mediterranean, and be able to go over it dry shot. Now, which river is this prophecy referring to? We cannot exactly prove. It may refer to both. But we know for certain that the Euphrates is to be dried up during the day of the Lord, as it says in Revelation 16, 12. The sixth plague of the seventh trumpet will be when the great Euphrates is completely dried up to allow the passage of the most massive army in all of human history, 200 million men out of Asia. Now, Zechariah chapter 10 and beginning in verse 10. Let us, brethren, review three scriptures that refer to the crossing of the Red Sea once again. Isaiah 11:15 is first of all, where God said that he would smite the tongue of the Egyptian Sea, referring to the Gulf of Suez. Today's English version of the Bible says, The Lord will dry up the Gulf of Suez, and he'll bring a mighty wind to dry up the Euphrates, leaving only seven tiny streams so that anyone can walk across. Zechariah 10.11 is speaking of Israel. In fact, Zechariah 10 is a second Exodus chapter, brethren. Please mark it in your Bible so that you would have that in mind. It's a second Exodus. It does not refer to the Exodus out of Egypt. No, this is a second Exodus. It will be a worldwide event. We'll come back to that later. But right now we are focusing on the future crossing of the Red Sea. So it says about Israel in verse 10, He shall pass through the sea with affliction. Better translation would be, He shall pass through the sea of affliction, or the sea of distress, because Israel was greatly distressed when they faced the Red Sea. Now why is the sea of affliction or the sea of distress a better translation? Because Israel was greatly distressed on that day, on this day, when they faced the Red Sea. They had the mountains on one side, the army of Pharaoh coming down behind them, and, and they had in front of them the Red Sea. They had no way out, they had no way to escape this army. So at that sea, the Red Sea was a day of great distress and mental affliction for Israelites because they believed that they were trapped. But here in future times, Israel will again pass through the sea of distress, the Red Sea, because it says, and it shall smite the waves in the sea, and all the de deeps of the river shall dry up. So here in this particular case, most commentaries believe that the river referred to is the Nile. Now if they're correct, then three great bodies of water are going to experience being dried up on the day of the Lord and at the return of Jesus Christ. Three great bo wo bodies of water. The Gulf of Suez, the Nile, and the Euphrates. 
And then the verse says, And the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 1. Here is, brethren, another second Exodus scripture. Please mark it in your Bible. And don't use your Bible as a clean book. Brethren, Bible is a textbook. It's a textbook to be used for our understanding. Not The Bible as a book is not holy. What is written in the Bible is holy, but the book itself is just a textbook, brethren. So use it as such. Mark it. You know, uh, write some references on the margins. It helps you in your Bible, personal Bible study to understand it better. Well, we're going tomorrow, we're going to speak about the Bible study and the importance of the Bible study. So, mark it. Isaiah 43, verse 1. Another second Exodus scripture. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Israel will be God's people again, brethren. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. The waters of the Nile or the water of the Euphrates, but particularly the Red Sea. God will be with his people in the second exodus through the rivers, the Nile, perhaps the Euphrates. And some of the modern Israelites may end up in captivity in Asia. Because why? Well, because they'll be sold as slaves around the world to all nations, though they will be concentrated in slavery in certain areas of the world. And we're going to see that in a moment. Well, I can tell you immediately. Those areas will be Central Europe, Germany, and its satellites, and Egypt. Look at the verse again. They shall not overflow you, those rivers. Brethren, this is the second exodus. Because it's talking about the rivers. It's not the sea, it's the rivers. Israelites are going to cross bodies of water once again, in plural. And it may not just be the Nile, or the Euphrates, or the Gulf of Suez. Maybe God will dry up the Danube for his people, and other rivers that stand in their path on their way to the promised, back to the promised land. Because the so-called lost Israel brethren will be coming, listen to this one, from all over the world. Yes, from all over the world. That's the second exodus. As shocking and dramatic as it would be. It would be something that the world would not be able to ignore. It would be an amazing event, brethren. It would be amazing and we are an integral part of that. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Well, we know that our fire is a type of trial, so it is symbolic. But the house of Israel, in one sense, is not being tried anymore because they have come out of their great tribulation. So they are now a free people in the second exodus on their way back to the promised land. But there will be those who will oppose them. Yet no bullets and no flamethrowers will be able to have any effect upon the returning Israel. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. You see, no matter what military armaments the beast or other nations may use to try to stop the returning Israel on its way back to the promised land, brethren. No military weapon will be able to stop their marching home. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Verse 3 and 4. For I am the Lord thy God, thy Holy, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for you. Since you were precious to me in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I'll give men for you. In other words, I'll put others to death that this remnant of Israel might live. I'll give men for you and people for your life. Verse 5. Fear not, for I am with you. I'll bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west. Brethren, notice that this cannot be the first exodus. The first exodus was only from Egypt, from one land, one location. Listen to this one. From seed from the east. Here it is east. And gather you from the west. Here is the west. I will say to the north, here is the north, give up. And to the south, here is the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. Brethren, Israel will be used as a tool, as instrument in God's hand for God's glory in the world to come. I have formed him, yes, I have made him. You see, clearly... Again, brethren, this is not the first exodus because Israel then came only out of Egypt. In this passage, the prophecy says, we have just read it, bring your seed from the east, 
from the west, from the north, and from the south, from the ends of the earth. In this great slave trade of the Great Tribulation, modern Israelites will be sold as slaves into all nations. And perhaps that's why the churches of God today refuse to preach that because to them it's a negative stuff. Why should they frighten people? Well, you have to tell the truth to the people, however unpleasant it will be. What happened with Isaiah's instruction to blow the trumpet, tell my people of their sins? So, in this great slave trade, modern Israelites will be sold as slaves into all nations. And each will be making individual ways, as well as group ways, on their return to the promised land. History is going to repeat itself, brethren, on a far more dramatic and grander scale. We are examining the history about the unfold, about to unfold before us and to see how Israel's second deliverance is to take place. Now, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great news? Isn't that exciting? Yes, Israel will be, will, because of its lawlessness, Israel is going to be punished, but Israel will return to its land. Israel will be restored. Israel will be used by God in the world to come to submit the whole world to the government of God and to the kingdom of God. What is wrong about that? What's so negative about that? Please listen carefully to this, what I'm, what we are hearing today, brethren. This is the last day of God love and bread. On this very day, Israelites who left Egypt crossed the Red Sea. And we see now in the future, they'll be crossing the bodies of water in plural. And in a minute you're going to see that there will be even greater miracles happening to them than what happened in the first exodus. What happened to Israelites in the, in the desert when they left Egypt. <coughs> now as I mentioned already, there are seven similarities between the first exodus and the second because indeed we learn about the second from the first. Here is the first similarity number one. A good portion of modern day Israel is going to be once again in the land of Egypt even though they're not conquered by Egypt. They'll be conquered by German-led United States of Europe. Deuteronomy 28 is one of the chapters on blessings and curses. Among the prophetic curses we find these statements in Deuteronomy 28 and here we will be reading the portion from verse 36 to 48. 36. The Eternal will bring you and the king whom you set over you. In other words, whatever government it is that modern Israel would have in the end time, he'll bring unto a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. Now in that time, brethren, Israel did not know the Assyrian Empire because they were in Egypt. They did not know in the sense of being a part of it. You see, look, their forefather Abraham, the forefather of Israel, had come out of the Euphrates region and Assyria was to become a great nation later toward the end of Israel's history and take them into a second captivity. The first one was to Egypt in the book of Exodus and then later on to Assyria as we read later on in the Kings and the Chronicles. The first one, the first captivity, I don't notice that it was in Egypt, but this was, you know, uh, this was what we read in Deuteronomy 28, verse 36. Brethren, that this is, what is uh, it is a prophetic verse. Applies It applies to the end time captivity. This is what God says primarily to the Israelites with the birthright. That is the British Commonwealth nations and the United States of America. He says, I will bring you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known. Well, those two nations have known, well, British and Americans, they have known of Germany. It's a country they defeated in both world wars. And let me just throw in another information that many people forget. The only ally that both British and Americans had in both world wars in East Europe, the only ally they had in East Europe, truly their ally was a little country known as Serbia. In any case, your fathers from Britain and America, they knew of Germany. But you see, in those world wars, your forefathers did not know the new nation that is now being formed before our eyes here in Europe. It's currently named European Union, which is soon to become the United States of Europe. Brethren, the coming United States of Europe will be a resurrection of the Roman Empire, but different in many ways. It is a new nation. It has never had such a name before, and it has never had this kind of organization before. Let's read verse 49. 
the Lord, 49, will bring a nation against you from afar, from the ends of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies. Eagle, brethren. The national emblem of Germany and Austria. Look at their flags. The national emblem of Germany and Austria, the modern Assyrians, is the eagle. As swift as the eagle flies, because the Germans are famous for their blitzkrieg maneuvers. A sudden attack, unexpected attack, just like in the Second World War, they attacked the capital of Serbia, Belgrade, which was proclaimed to be the open city. They attacked it without any announcement of war, without any previous uh, warning. They attacked the city and very soon they occupied the whole nation, partitioning between its allies and committed horrible genocide during the Second World War. So the Germans are famous. This is, you know, swift as the eagle flies. They're famous blitzkrieg maneuvers. A nation whose language you will not understand. Well, German is mostly known language among the modern Israelites that hold the birthright promises. It's an unknown language between you people in Britain and Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders and the United States of America. How many of you know German language? Not only that, but you know, many, many of us here in Europe really laugh at German language as being, you know, completely non-understandable. We call them in Slavic, Slavic nations, the only, you all, the whole world called Germany, Germany, which means man of war, it's the Roman name, but only Slavic nations call them Nemačka, name, uh, uh, from the word mute. People who do not know how to speak. We call them mute people, you see? Or dumb people. So when we as Slavs read this portion of the Bible, we understand very well what nation will be with the unknown language, brethren. Be clear about that. It's Germany. Not many people believe that Germany will rise again to the world scene. There will be the power that will destroy many nations. Nobody believes that. They believe that Germany has denazified itself. No, 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 no. Germans hold... Very deep grudge against the Anglo-Saxon world because they were defeated two times in both world wars. Verse 50, a nation of fierce countenance which does not regard the person of the old or show favor to the young. Well, if somebody can testify that to you, brethren, it's here. I can testify to you how their fierce countenance nation, they have no regard for any life, especially for those whom they consider to be a lower race. The Slavic people, the Serbian people, which are part of the Slavic corpus of nations, the Serbian people to them were just something slightly above the, the animals. Good only for labor, for forced labor. This nation in which I live, brethren, was twice victim of the German genocide in both world wars. And Germany exemplified itself as such a nation, you know, of fierce continents with no regard for person of old or show favor to the children in both world wars, but especially in the Second World War with the concentration camps and death camps. And you know what, you people in the Anglo-Saxon world, what they have done to the Jewish people, what they have done to the Jewish people in the Second World War, the Holocaust, they're exactly going to do the same to the house of Israel at large. Perhaps that is why, perhaps that is why the Great Tribulation is called the Great, because it will be much wider than what the Holocaust was. We still here in my nation vividly remember the fierce countenance of Germany. Now, the Anglo-Saxon world has never experienced Germans occupy their lands. So this is the prophetic verse in which God says that Britain and America primarily are to be defeated by the coming German-led United States of Europe. And now, please, brethren, look at verse 68. And God shall bring you into Egypt. Well, you see, Britain and America will not be conquered by Egypt. Now, Egypt, Egypt is to be later conquered by the German-led Europe when the prophesied king of the south pushes against the king of the north. The king of the south will be then defeated and Egypt will become a colony of Europe. But following the coming Anglo-Saxon nation's defeat by the German-led Europe, a good portion of British and Americans will be taken down into Egypt, probably to be used as slave laborers. Just remember, as Israelites were in ancient times used for building the treasuries, uh, treasured cities of Pithom and Ramses. So history is repeating itself, brethren. And the Lord shall bring you into Egypt again. Again. But not the way they went the first time. The first time they walked. 
they walked into Egypt. But this time, you see, he'll bring them to Egypt again. The Lord shall bring you into Egypt again with ships. This is a prophecy, brethren. This prophecy was written at the time of Moses, but it has never been fulfilled. In all of Israel's history, the Israelites have never been taken to Egypt in ships. Many Americans are to be taken across the Atlantic Ocean in ships, and many Canadians and Australians and New Zealanders in ships and to the Strait of Gibraltar to Egypt to do great works projects for the beast in that part of the world. The Eternal shall bring you into Egypt again. The Lord shall bring you into Egypt again with ships. By the way, whereof I spoke to thee, you shall see it no more again. And there shall there shall you be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. No one shall buy you back. Brethren, that is a prophecy. This prophecy says to modern Britain, America, and other Israelites in Scandinavia, France, and Benelux, it says, you will not be redeemed. It will be a permanent slavery for you unless Jesus Christ returned to deliver his people. That is the first similarity between this exodus to come and the one of the old. Some of modern Israelites will be in Egypt once again. The second similarity, Exodus chapter 7. Exodus 7 verse 1. God said to Moses, See, I have made you a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet, that is your spokesman, now the two men were to go before Pharaoh to speak on behalf of those Israelites in captivity in Egypt. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he shall send the children of Israel out of the land, out of his land. Verse 3, And I'll harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt, and bring forth my armies, or my hosts, and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Once again, many peoples in the world will know that God is the God of Israel when he stretches forth his hand upon Egypt and upon other nations to bring out his people in the great future second exodus. Pharaoh was a type of the beast, of the coming European dictator, which we here have very good basis to believe that would be Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg. But even if it's not, if it's not him, it'll be somebody of the German origin for sure, and of aristocratic stock. Well, interestingly enough, Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg, through his, I think, maternal line, is the descendant of the Habsburg dynasty. Now Pharaoh was a type of the beast anyway, of that coming European dictator, whoever he might be. Moses and Aaron were a type of the two witnesses. The two witnesses will go to the beast of Europe, particularly during the day of the Lord, when the great tribulation, when the tribulation of the modern Israelites is complete. And during that one year of the day of the Lord, they will have the same message to the beast that Moses and Aaron had to Pharaoh. Let my people go. Verse 16, And you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go. Now turn to Revelation chapter 11, brethren, if you will. The two witnesses will prophesy for three and a half years. The major thrust of their message during the final year prior to Christ's return will be to the rulers of the nations that hold Israelites captive, and particularly to the beast and to the false prophet the false prophet, the Roman Pope, whoever he will be at that time. So the main message, the main message will be, let God's people go. The heart of the beast and the heart of the false prophet will be hardened. Moreover, the hearts of all the other rulers will be like Pharaoh's. God will exact great judgment against them to force their hand. And they, like Pharaoh, will finally relent. Revelation 11.3 and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. Verse 5. And if any man will hurt him, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. Just like Elijah of old, you see, these two witnesses will have power to call fire down from heaven. 
Brethren, Elijah slew his hundred men that way, two bands of fifty. These two men will have the same power. And if any man will hurt them, so if any man tries to oppose those two, these two witnesses, he must in this manner be killed. Verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now that is the same power that Elijah had, but also the same power that Moses and Aaron had, because it goes on to say, and have power over waters to turn them to blood. You see, the first of the ten plagues upon Egypt was to turn waters into blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will, just as Moses and Aaron smote Egypt with different plagues. So these two witnesses will be doing a work of preaching God's gospel message to the world. And particularly during the final year, their message to the rulers of the world will be, let God's people go. So time after time, the rulers will refuse, and the two witnesses, like Moses and Aaron, will call for a different plague upon those nations. Plague after plague, until finally, those nations come to the point of relenting. Though even then, in certain areas in Israel, the house of Israel will have to force its way out, as we are going to see. The third similarity is the timing of the Exodus, brethren. The timing is given to us in Isaiah chapter 27. Israel left Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread, which we marked uh, seven days ago as we kept the night to be much observed. And I hope if you have not read that portion of Exodus from Exodus uh, chapter 12, where we are commanded to keep the night to be much observed, I would encourage you to make that a, a customary part of our observance. We need to be reminded constantly from the word of God why we do certain things. And it says that in all our generations, all Israel will remember the night when they left Egypt. So Israel left Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread. Now here in Isaiah 27, the indications are given that Jesus Christ will return on a feast of trumpets. Now the feast of trumpets symbolizes his return. We know that. And it is most likely that he was born on the feast of trumpets. Well, he certainly was born around that time of the year. He was not born in the winter. And we can prove that from the Bible, although the Bible does not give us the exact day. But the similarity would be that both Exoduses begin with a holiday of God, a day of special deliverance. With the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we are delivered from the world, and Israel of old was delivered from Egypt. With the Feast of Trumpets, Jesus Christ returns to deliver humankind from itself, and it would seem from the scripture to deliver his people from captivity. Isaiah 27 verse 12. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the eternal shall beat off from the channel of the river, to the stream of Egypt, and you shall be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. Now, as one translation puts it, the time will come when God will gather them one by one like hand-picked grain, selecting them from his great threshing floor that reaches all the way from the Euphrates River to the Egyptian boundary. Because the Israel of the world to come will be a larger nation than the Israel in the promised land when that we have known in the past. Verse 13. And it shall come to pass in that day. What shall come to pass? Well, that the great trumpet shall be blown. Well, brethren, we know what is the great trumpet, the last seventh trumpet of Revelation. The great trumpet shall be blown and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria because a good portion of modern Israel will be in Central Europe, in Germany. And the outcasts in the land of Egypt. Well, you see, Assyria and Egypt will be the two major concentrations of Israel during the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation will last two and a half years, followed by one year, Day of the Lord, just as Israel of old time suffered a captivity in Egypt and a captivity in Assyria. But this time, brethren, this time, in the coming Great Tribulation, also called Jacob's Trouble, those two captivities will be side by side. The greater portion of captured British and Americans will be in Europe and in Egypt, although others will be scattered, sold as slaves around the world. Now we have just read it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown. Well, the seventh trumpet is that in the book of Revelation heralds the return of Jesus Christ. And they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship God in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. So the third similarity indicates, the third similarity indicated that is, is the holiday. The first exodus occurred on a holiday. 
during the days of unleavened bread. The second exodus may also occur on a holiday. And again, the timing is given to us in Isaiah 27. It is not, however, going to be during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, if this scripture is intended to be taken literally. You see, they left Egypt on the first day of Unleavened Bread, and here in Isaiah 27, the indications are given, and we believe that Jesus Christ will return on a Feast of Trumpets. No, of course he doesn't have to, but the Feast of Trumpets just symbolizes his return. But it could be, well, it could well be that he comes back on the literal day, just as it could well be that he was born on a Feast of Trumpets. But the similarity would be, if it is the Feast of Trumpets, that both exoduses, they begin with a holy day of God, a day of special deliverance. With the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we are delivered from the world, and Israel of old was delivered from Egypt. With the Feast of Trumpets, Jesus Christ returns to deliver humankind from itself, and of course, the captured Israel. The fourth similarity is that Israelitish people, will be spared the seven last plagues. Exodus chapter 8, verse 22. In Exodus chapter 8, it tells us that after the first three plagues of the ten that came upon Egypt, God said to Pharaoh that he would perform an extra miracle. Exodus eight twenty-two, And I'll severe in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end... Thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I'll put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. You see, the land of Goshen was located east of the Nile River. Israelites did not have to cross it when they lived in the land of Goshen. They were living east of it. If the Nile is dried up in the future, it will mean that some of Israelites are west of the Nile. But God said he would set apart the land of Goshen for the seven remaining plagues of the tenth. Of the ten in Revelation chapter chapter eighteen, we find that Israel in the future, at the return of Jesus Christ, is spared the seven last plagues. Because when the seventh trump sounds, heralding the deliverance of Israel by Jesus Christ, the seven last plagues are poured upon nations, but particularly upon the beast power. Revelation eighteen four, well known scripture, brethren. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. It is talking about Babylon, under quotation marks, and we see that from preceding scriptures. So Israel of old was protected from the last seven of the ten plagues upon Egypt. Likewise, they'll be protected from the seven last plagues of the book of Revelation. The fifth similarity, Israel of old, Exodus 14 and verse 8, came out of Egypt with a high hand. So it will be in the second exodus. Isaiah 52 verse 11. Brethren, a good portion of Isaiah 52, mark it in your Bible, talks about the second exodus. So do not be confused. Do not be confused. It's obvious that it speaks about the second exodus, and we'll see why. The first six verses in Isaiah 52 very clearly speak about Israel's coming captivity and Israel's deliverance in the coming second exodus. Verse 7 and verse 8 speak about this work of God, about preaching the good news of the coming kingdom of God and the return of Jesus Christ. Verse 9 and verse 10 tell modern Israelites to rejoice in the deliverance which will come to them because as it says in the latter part of verse 10, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of of our God. All the ends of the of the earth. Not just Egypt and Egyptians. Now notice verse 11 and verse 12. The depart you, depart. Depart you, go you out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. As we read in Revelation 18.4, they are called out of Babylon. Other quotation mark is spiritual Babylon. Well, it's the resurrected Roman Empire, meaning Europe. So they're called out of Babylon and not to be a partaker of her sins, so they might be delivered from the seven last plagues. So here, depart you, depart you, go you out from thence, touch no unclean thing, get you out of the midst of her, be you clean that bear, that bear the vessels of the Lord. This was fulfilled in type with Ezra's exodus out of captivity from Babylon. Ezra bore the vessels of God because they had been taken from the temple of Solomon to Babylon. 
Now Cyrus the Great permitted the returning Jews to take those vessels back for the rebuilding of Zerubbabel's temple. But the overall context shows that even though this was fulfilled in type historically by Ezra, the main part of this prophecy actually remains for the second exodus to come. Verse 12. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For God will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. You see, with the pillar of fire and the cloud that sheltered Israel before they were to cross the Red Sea, God was their rear guard and protected them, but he also led them out of Egypt and led them through the wilderness. Yes, Israel did eat the Passover in haste. And it is true that the Egyptians tried to push Israel out because they said, for we be all dead men after the tenth plague when the firstborn were killed. But Israel did not go out by flight. They did not flee Egypt. They went out in an orderly manner on the first day of unleavened bread. And so again, modern day Israelites will not go out with haste and by flight. They won't be fleeing from Assyria. They'll be walking out because God will go before them and the God of Israel will be their rear guard. Then this chapter goes on to say about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The next chapter also deals with Jesus Christ's crucifixion in the context of the second exodus because the first exodus had occurred during the Feast of Unleavened Bread following the Passover. In the second exodus, God, who is to go before them and be their rear guard, will be Jesus Christ himself who died for them and was returned at the Feast of Trumpets. At his return, when the great trumpet is blown, they'll be brought out of their captivity. So Israel, once again, is going to go out with a high hand. It is interesting that Isaiah 52 ties in the second exodus with the Passover sacrifice of Jesus Christ because he is the God, he is the God that brought about the first exodus and will also lead the second. The sixth similarity is that they are going to be Tremendous miracles once again, even greater than those that took place during the first exodus. Micah chapter 7 and beginning in verse 12. Micah 7 verse 12. In that day also he shall come even to you from Assyria and from the fortified cities and from the fortress even to the river and from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. Now, some commentaries believe that he shall come is referring to Israel coming back to Jerusalem. Well, this is how today's English version puts it. Your people will return to you from everywhere, from Assyria in the east, from Egypt in the south, from the region of the Euphrates River, from distant seas and far off mountains. You see, because they will have been, they will have been scattered around the world. Verse 15. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, the first time, will I show to him marvelous things. Brethren, history is going to repeat itself. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, God performed great miracles of deliverance back then. He will show modern day Israelites marvelous things in the future. He will perform great miracles for them as he will be bringing the remnant of the twelve tribes back to the, their promised land. Oh yes, great miracles again. This is the sixth similarity. One of those great miracles we mentioned was the future crossing of the Red Sea. Now we should not be surprised if God has future Israel cross the Red Sea at the exact same location that ancient Israel crossed it. Well perhaps, and this is only a speculation, the forces of the beast occupying Egypt may come after those Israelites at the Red Sea in the same place where they were trapped in ancient times. And God will open up the Red Sea exactly as he did before. Now this is of course my speculation. It may not happen. But the forces of the beast may also come after the people of Israel in other areas. And as they begin to escape, they might try to overtake them and to destroy them. Just as when the Philadelphian remnant of the Church of God flees and European forces will come after it. And the Bible shows in the book of Revelation that the earth is going to open its mouth and then... European army is going to be swallowed up. Now again, this is only a speculation. But one thing is certain, brethren. Great and marvelous things are to be done for Israel once again. Isaiah 48 indicates another miracle that will be performed at that time. 
Isaiah 48 verse 20, verse 20, 20 is speaking about a historical event, but we are learning about the second Exodus from the first. Undoubtedly, this that happened back then will be repeated. Isaiah 48 verse 20 and 21. Go you forth of Babylon, flee you from the Chaldeans, with a voice of signing declare you, tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Read in the second Exodus, when all humankind is involved in what has been done to Israel, say you that God has redeemed his servant Jacob. And they thirsted not when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. That was a miracle that was performed by God through Moses. He claved the rock also and the waters gushed out. Well, no wonder God is going to show Israel marvelous things again, brethren. There are des- de- deserts that they will have to cross to get back to the promised land. You know, there will be wildernesses created out of the warfare of the coming three and a half years of the great tribulation and the day of the Lord. God will have to provide special miracles to feed them and to take care of their thirst. And so verse 21, though it is harking back to a historical event, does so in the context of the future exodus. There will be times when the leaders of these, those people will smite the rock and water will come out for them. <coughs> so the sixth similarity is the duplication of the great miracles and undoubtedly even greater miracles than greater than before and certainly more extensive miracles because the scope is going to be far vaster with the second exodus than it was for the first brethren the first involved coming out of one nation the second exodus as we have seen involves coming from the four corners of the of the earth now here is the seventh similarity it is indicated that israel will be organized to a certain extent into armies once again it's only indicated because there are scriptures that tells us that israel when they come out of captivity, will fight their enemies. Now in Exodus 13 and verse 11, it says that Israel came up out of Egypt harnessed. Literally in the Hebrew, it says five abreast. They came out in ranks because Moses, before the 40 years he spent as a shepherd, had been a great and famous general for the Egyptian people and had defeated Ethiopia to the south of them with a great and tremendous victory. In fact, Josephus says that Moses was given the title the general. Now God gave him that training so that when he would bring about three million people out of Egypt with his army and military training, there would not be a mass confusion. To bring three million people out of Egypt rather than take them to the Red Sea and then through the wilderness, that had to be properly organized. And of course God is an organized God, so Moses was given a special training And later on, Israel, because of their lack of faith, had to fight in the wilderness and fight their way into the promised land. Now, it is strange that modern Israel, or better put, the remnant of modern Israel that survived the coming Great Tribulation and come out in the second Exodus, would be allowed by God to fight as soldiers against their enemies. Well, we do not fully understand, you know, why. We can only have certain speculations based on what it says in the Bible. Perhaps such scriptures are to be interpreted symbolically, but if we read them at face value, it does indicate that when Jesus Christ returns, the people who come out of captivity will fight against their enemies. Zechariah 14 verse 14. This verse has nothing to do with the second exodus, but it will lay the ground for this seventh and final similarity. Zechariah 14 is speaking about the return of Jesus Christ. He speaks about the destruction of of the armies of Europe and Asia that will, that will be gathered together in the great valley of Jehoshaphat outside of Jerusalem. This great battle is for control of the future capital of the world, Jerusalem, and it speaks of the special plague that God will pour out upon those Egyptian and Asiatic armies uh, joined together when they were ready to fight each other to death in a world, in a world cosmos side. Now from verse 12 on, it is talking about the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Zechariah 14, 14 says, And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem. Now this is the point where Jesus Christ is to come 
to the Mount of Olives. He is about to fight the enemies of God in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Now it is strange to think of the remnant of Israel being allowed to fight. Now Jesus Christ, of course, said in John 18.36 that his friends, servants could not fight. And several Greek uh, words are translated in the King James, ver James Version as world. One of them, aeon, means age. When the disciples said, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the world, the Greek word is age. So they were asking not for the end of the world, but actually uh, the end of the age. In Matthew, when the gospel is to be preached to, into all the world, another Greek word is used meaning the civilized, inhabited world. The gospel was not to be preached to the jungles and remote areas, but to the civilized areas of the world. It had particular reference to the Roman Empire. In other words, we go to the literate people of the world because, you know, the illiterate people who live in jungles and swamps could not understand it even if we took it to them. Now, the word used here in John 18 verse 36 is cosmos, which means the world as created by God. We could say planet Earth. You know, my kingdom is not of this cosmos, the earth as created by God. Yet we know that Jesus Christ's kingdom in the future is going to be of this cosmos. It's going to be down here on planet earth. But at, at that time his kingdom was not of this world. Well, because he said, but now is my kingdom not from here. So where is it from? Well, it is from heaven. That is why it is called the kingdom of heaven because that is where it is coming from down to this earth. As his kingdom will be on this world in a, you know, in, in the future age and it will be on this cosmos. And when Jesus Christ returns, he doesn't return as the Lamb of God. No, we know that he returns as the Lion of Judah to tear the prey into pieces. Jesus Christ, who was a conscientious objective back then, is coming back to fight and to make war. He rides a white horse with robe dipped in blood. And he has angelic armies who are going to fight with him. Well, we also will fight. We will have a part in destroying those who are contrary to God. Now, this still does not, not explain, you know, why Israel will be allowed to fight because, in essence, they don't really need to if we are going to do the fighting for them and destroy their enemies. Now, several scriptures, however, indicate that we will fight. They may have simply spiritual application, okay, but, you know, the one that we have just read in Zechariah 40.40 seems pretty clear. The remnant of Israel will be like ancient Israel when they came out of Egypt. You know, those who came out of Egypt, they were unconverted people and they didn't have enough faith to trust God to fight their battles for them. And these people coming out of captivity are also unconverted at this point and they also may lack the faith. That's why God may have them fight, but not just for their own benefit, but also for the benefit of the Gentiles. To teach the Gentiles some very important lessons that these people were physically helpless and powerless before them and now suddenly they're invincible. Well, nobody on the face of the earth, despite the unbelievable technological advances of this century, can destroy this slave people. God may use it as a tremendous witness to the nations. Now, once Israel is converted in the world to come, we don't see them fighting. We Remember we read Ezekiel 38, when Gog and Magog came down and invaded the, the new nation of Israel. There was no indication that, there, that the Israel, you know, Israelites were fighting and uh, fighting against their enemies. No, it talks only about God, you know, doing great plagues and destruction upon those Asiatic armies that invite the Middle East at the, that time. But let's read some other scriptures. Isaiah chapter 11, beginning in verse 10. Isaiah 11. Let us take a look at some of the wars that it is indicated that Israel coming out of captivity will fight. The, this first war is against the Arabs. What a surprise. <laughs> As at 11 verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that God shall set his hand again the second time for the second exodus to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt the two major locations, but also from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath 
and from the islands of the sea. So from the different countries of the world. Verse 12, And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The enemy, verse 13, also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Well, there will no longer be a northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. They will be united as one under the rulership of King David in the kingdom of God. But notice, in their second exodus, on their way back to their homeland, verse 14, But, together Judah and Ephraim, they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, who live by the Mediterranean. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon should obey them. Well, one translation says, The kingdom of Israel will not be jealous of Judah anymore, and Judah will not be the enemy of Israel. Together they will attack the Philistines on the west and plunder the people who live in uh, live to the east, and they will uh, conquer the people of Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon will obey them. Now this upon the shoulders, Jameson Fawcett and Brown comment that this expression expresses that is an attack made unexpectedly on one from behind. Now the image is most apt in the Hebrew, for shoulders is also shown to refer in the numbers to a maritime coast. Now the Philistines dwelt on a maritime coast, the shoulders of Canaan. Jameson Fawcett and Brown go on to say, quote, They shall make a sudden victorious descent upon the borders of the Philistines, southwest of Judea, end of the quote. Now another translation of verse 14 in Isaiah 11 says this, Together they will fly against the nations, possessing their land on the east and on the west, uniting forces to destroy them, end of the quote. So these scriptures indicate that the remnant of Israel, brethren, is going to be allowed to fight this one war at least, you know, at this time. You know, allowed to fight to conquer the Philistines in the Gaza Strip and to force the surrounding Arabic nations into submission. Here is what it says, verse, what it says in verse 16, in their, in, in, in the latter part. Like as it was to Israel, uh, in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt, so like it was. So brethren, history is to repeat itself. But there is another portion of Israel coming out of the north, out of Europe. And the Bible indicates that they also will fight a war. When they cross the Dardanelles into modern-day Turkey, they will fight a war against the Turks. Obadiah, beginning in verse 10, Obadiah is a prophet about the fate of modern-day modern day Edom, that is. A part of Edom resides in Asia Minor, known today as Turkey. Now, Obadiah chapter, uh, there is only one chapter, but there is uh, now verse 10. For your violence against your brother Jacob shall cover you, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his force, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lot upon Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. Well, this had historical fulfillment with Nebuchadnezzar's invasion. But the Babylonians better destroyed Jerusalem. A time is coming when they will just cast lots upon it. And Jerusalem will be occupied by the power of the beast. That is what is waiting for Jerusalem. Then in verse 12. But thou should not have looked on the day of your brother, in the day that he became a stranger. Neither should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. And then verse 13, You should not have entered into the gate of my people in their in in, in the day of their calamity. Yes, you should have not looked on their affliction 
in the day of their calamity, nor have nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Verse 14, neither should you have stood in the crossway. Now, some commentaries believe that uh, this is referring unto the this is referring to mountain passes. But there is a particular crossway between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea is the Dardanelli passage that joins Europe to the Middle East. And it would seem there there will be Israelites that would try to escape out of Europe through that crossway and that the Turks will show them no favor. Verse 14. Neither should you have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither should you have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of this in the day of distress. So uh, God is uh, God in Obadiah prophesies a special punishment for Edom. For Edom, and He gives the same prophecy also in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. God says that all male Edomites, Turks, will be destroyed. And how are they to be destroyed? Well, verse 18, And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. Well, there shall not, well, there shall, there, there shall not remain any of the men, because Jeremiah and Ezekiel show that it is just the male Edomites that are going to be killed. But it does not say that God will destroy them. It says that the house of Jacob shall be a fire, but it does indicate a war of extermination, you see. And, uh, you know, Israel did have a war of extermination against the Midianites before they entered the Promised Land. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, Midianites killed all the males. The, the women of, of Exodus will be spared, the women of, not Exodus, but women of Edom will be spared. You know, they will not be attacking those who participate in Exodus. So the women of Edom, the women of Turkey will be spared. But the context, if we read the succeeding verses, verse 19, 20 and 21, is clearly talking about Israel in the world to come. He says in verse 21, And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now again, we have indications that the remnant of Israel will fight. Whether that will be uh, the case or not, well, if that is what God plans and wants for his people, then God has good reasons for allowing it temporarily to be so. It is, you know, it is hard. It's hard for us to think of people, you know, people of God killing people. It goes contrary to everything we believe. But though, but then, you know, yet, we have just reread in, in chapter 11 of Revelation that there are two servants of God who will kill hundreds, perhaps thousands of people when they become the two witnesses. Now those who oppose them will be destroyed by fire from heaven. It will not be the two witnesses that will actually do the killing. You know, they will call for the fire of El as Elijah, as Elijah did, and God will do the work of killing the, those people. But they're going not, they're not going to be conscientious objectors. In the sense of saying, well, sure, you oppose me, arrest me, and throw me in jail, torture me. You see, so when Jesus Christ returns, he does not return as the Lion of Judah. We are going to, you know, we are going to fight on, on, on his side. That we, that we can understand because Jesus Christ is going to fight, you know. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Now we could, we could ignore these scriptures, brethren, but they are in the Bible. You know, if they turn out not only to have symbolic meaning, so be it, but reading them at face value, uh, the indications are there, uh, the indications are there that the remnant of Israel will fight. Then we continue and we read, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you have little, you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you Shall he come forth to me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth being from everlasting from all time? 
Now this of course is Jesus Christ. Verse 5. And this man, man of course Jesus Christ, shall be the peace. When the Assyrians shall come into our land, then when the Assyrians shall tre- tread on, uh, in our palaces, then shall them, then shall we, that is, Israel, we shall raise against the seven, him, seven shepherds and eight principal men. Well, verse 6. And they, the seven shepherds and the eight right, principal men, shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrance thereof. Thus shall he, Jesus Christ, deliver us from the Assyria when the Assyrian comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. Verse 7, And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the eternal, as the showers upon the grass, uh, that there is not for men, nor waits for the sons of men. Now, who are the seven shepherds and the eight principal men? Well, the Bible does not tell us, brethren. It would appear to be symbolic language. In Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1 and 2, it says, Cast your bread upon the waters, give a serving to seven and also to eight. Well, this is a symbolic language of going out above and beyond. In other words, What is being said here is that we will raise again him more than enough in the way of power to waste the land of Assyria with the sword. The land of Assyria will be wasted, of course, at the end of the second woe, because, you know, there will be invasion of the Asians into Europe. But there may be, along with that, a pursuit by the beast power from Europe, chasing some of Israelites as they head down to the promised land. But the seven shepherds and the eight principal men were to represent, undoubtedly, the Savior of Obadiah, verse 21. Those who lived as human, you know, as human beings in this time, in God's church, and have become spirit beings in God's realm. Because our liberation, liberation from this fleshly body is tied in very much with the liberation of Israel from slavery. Isaiah 61, and beginning in verse 1. When the remnant of Israel finally enters the promised land after their second exodus, they will be a people who will have been purged from the rebels among them, as prophesied in the book of Ezekiel. Now only those who are truly submissive to Almighty God of Israel will enter the promised land. But our liberation from the flesh, from this tabernacle of corruption, is tied in very much with the liberation of Israel from its slavery To this world. Isaiah 61 verse 1. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because God has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to uh, to bind up the broken hearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of prison to them that are bound. Well you see when Jesus Christ returns. And we are changed into spirit. We are going to be sent by Jesus Christ out to the four corners of the world to gather his people out of their captivity to bring them out of prison and out of bondage. As Moses was a general to lead Israel out of Egypt, so we will be generals under Jesus Christ to bring the people of God to Jesus Christ at Jerusalem. Verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all the all who that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the eternal, who will be planted, you know, in the promised land of the kingdom of God, that he might be glorified. So, we will release the surviving Israelites from the concentration camps, from the prisons, from wherever they will be held in slavery. And we will be used by Jesus Christ to bring his people back to him. We are to be the generals under Jesus Christ. The generals of Israelitish armies and John and Jesus Christ is going to be our Joshua. <laughs> well, you wonder why Joshua. Israel, who has been so great in power during the last century, is about to experience a reversal in power unparalleled in all of human history. No nation in history will have been so great and then so suddenly brought to nothing in total and totally conquered. 
Well, however, there will be another tremendous re- reversal at the end of the apocalypse. Those three and a half years of the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord, Israel is going to become a great power once again and the greatest, you know, the greatest of powers on this earth. Micah chapter 7 and now let's go to verse 16. Micah 7, 16. The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. You know, those who are one day slaves are suddenly going to be called of God to become a fantastic power on the face of the earth. All the other nations of the world will be confounded at the might of the new Israel. You see, the Gentiles, they shall lay their hands upon their mouth in astonishment. Their ears should be as though they were deaf. Verse 16. The Gentiles again shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the eternal God and shall fear because of you, because of Israel. So they'll be afraid, brethren, of this new power of Israel because it will be utterly invincible. It will be a people called of God to repentance and empowered by God to come back to the promised land. Now Isaiah 49, verse 8. Thus says the Eternal, in an acceptable time have I heard you, and in a day of salvation have I helped you, and I'll preserve you, and give you for a covenant of the people to establish the earth. In other words, to help me create that world to come, to cause to inherit the desolate heritage. That is what we are called to do, brethren. That's what we are called to do. Verse 9. That you may also say to the prisoners, Go forth. To them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. And when we bring them out of the second Exodus, verse 10, verse 10, they shall not hunger, nor thirst, for the miracles of breaking the rocks will be done. Neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that has mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Thus says the eternal God, verse 22, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring your sons in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Well, Hosea chapter 9 shows us that the most that most of the children of Israel in Israel today will not survive the Great Tribulation, brethren. But the minority will. There will be some children. And when God lifts up His standards, they shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. You see, we certainly do not feel easy, uh, you know, with, with the current breaking of the pride of Israelites' power. You know, we do not feel happy about the coming defeats of the house of Israel that are going to take place around the world, but a new day is going to happen, is going to dawn, and the great mass migration of peoples, unparalleled in history, is going to take place. Now how, you know, how many people are there in the, in the nations of Israel today? Well, you see, several hundred millions for sure. If God takes a tenth of those peoples, we are t- talking about An enormous second Exodus, brethren. Of course, we understand that many people living within the confines of the Israelite nations are Gentiles. But then again, keep in mind, there are many Israelites living in Gentile nations across the world as well. And we cannot come up with the exact figure. We can estimate that there will be at least 50 million of Israelites who survive. And that is more than 10 times the size of the first Exodus. When the nations of the world watch 50 or so million people migrate from the ends of the earth to the promised land that is going to be an, that is going to be an event which they will not be able to ignore. An event that is going to proclaim the glory of God. So what he will do with Israel, uh, he will proclaim his own glory. That is how important it is to be aware of the role of Israel in the plan of God. Now the bulk of Zechariah 10 speaks about the coming second exodus. Well, here's what God says, Zechariah 10 verse 3. My anger was kindled against the shepherds of Israel, that is the governments, and I'll punish the goats, 
For the eternal of hosts has visited his flock, his flock, uh, the house of Judah, and with Judah he, he has made them all as his goodly horse in the battle. Now Zechariah 14, 14 says it is the battle of the great day of the Lord. Verse 4, one of him, Judah, came forth the corner. Out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every ruler, as it should be translated, out of him every ruler together, uh, because of the, the prophecy said that the, the scepter would not depart from Judah. Then verse 5. And they, the Jews, shall be as mighty men which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle because they will be fighting at, at Jerusalem. And it says, Zechariah 14, 14. And they shall fight because uh, God is with them and the riders on horses shall be confounded. Now, commentators believe that uh, that this is referring historically to the Maccabees. But brethren, it cannot be so because it also talks about Ephraim. Ephraim shall be my, like mighty men and Ephraim was not a part of the history of the Maccabees. Ephraim was elsewhere on the face of the earth. When we read the succeeding verses, we see clearly that God is talking about the second exodus. Look at verse 7. And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their hearts shall rejoice as through wine. Yes, their children shall not shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the eternal. Verse 8. I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have uh, increased. We, go, we come now to verse 9. And I saw them in the past time among the people. I scattered them among the nations and in those far countries of their slavery. They shall remember me and they shall live with their children and turn again. I'll bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. And I'll bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon and place shall not be found for them and I'll strengthen them in the eternal and they shall walk up down and down the earth in his name meaning in the kingdom of God brethren and finally let us see Jeremiah chapter 23 now next week we are going to return to reading Jeremiah chapter by chapter analyzing chapter by chapter so uh, we'll be certainly coming back to this chapter but anyway let's uh, Finally see that chapter, Jeremiah chapter 23 and beginning in verse 3. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them. Now we are the shepherds, brethren. We are the saviors with lowercase s and plural of Obadiah 21. So I will, shep, uh, I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them. I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, says the Eternal. Well, brethren, the first Exodus, the one that we have celebrated during these wonderful seven days of unleavened bread, the first Exodus was a prophetic event was a prophetic event because it symbolized the second exodus in which we will have a hand in making it. Look at verse 7. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the eternal, that they shall no more say, the Lord lives, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. You see, brethren, the historical record will be there in the Bible in the kingdom of God. But the, this exodus to come... Ten times as great as the first, more extensive in scope, will be a miracle so great, so massive in scale and so dramatic that the first exodus will pale beside the second. Verse 8, But the Lord lives, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from the old countries whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Brethren, Israelites, once crossed the Red Sea on this very day, the last day of unleavened bread. One day soon, 
the remnant of Israel is going to cross the Red Sea a second time, perhaps at the very same location where it happened historically. One day soon, Israel is going to enter the Promised Land second time. And one day soon, Israel of God is going to become a great and mighty people a second time. But this time, for the first time, there will be a converted people whom God will be able to use in the service to all humankind in the kingdom of God.